Welcome everyone to uh, this joint Money Macro and Finance Society and National Institute meeting, um, which marks the 25th anniversary year of the Monetary Policy Committee. My name is Paul Mislin, I'm the chairman of the MMF, and I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone here on behalf of the MMF and the National Institute. Um, if you look around, you may be uh, wondering where Jagjit is. Um, well, Jagjit's got another appointment. He's collecting his MBE today from the Queen in Windsor. So unfortunately he can't be here, but we hope he'll have a great day. Um, hopefully he'll see some of the recordings afterwards. Anyway, it's a great pleasure to see so many current and former MPC members present today and to welcome Ben Broadbent, Deputy Governor for Monetary Policy, who will be giving an on the record speech in just a few minutes. Um, many of us, many of you will be taking part in our discussions later as well, and we're looking forward to that. So let me just briefly set the scene uh, for today's proceedings. It's no exaggeration to say that granting independence to the Bank of England in May uh, 1997 and, and the formation of the MPC was a significant moment in UK monetary history. It was, in many ways, the culmination of a process of giving UK monetary policy greater credibility, which started two, at least two decades before. The dire monetary policy experience of the 1970s led to successive governments to experiment with many designs for UK monetary policy. This involved adjusting the objective for monetary policy to monetary growth targets, and then to exchange rate targets, first shadowing the Deutsche Mark and then maintaining the exchange rate with a basket of European currencies in the ERM. Each system was designed to provide an anchor for monetary policy and set credible bounds for inflation, but none proved particularly effective. And after the ignominious exit from the ERM in 1992, the bank was given an inflation target set as a range from 1% to 4%. And from 1992 to 1997, the governor and the chancellor of the Exchequer discussed the arguments for changing the bank rate at monthly meetings with the inflation objective central to their exchange of views. The Treasury had appointed a panel of outside forecasters, which were dubbed the wise men, and until Kate Barker joined, they were all men. Um, uh, and they advised the Chancellor on expected performance of the UK economy. But the decision on interest rates was still one for the Chancellor alone. And all that changed in May 1997, when the bank was granted independence and the MPC was formed to set bank rate independently. And the remit had been set by the Treasury, an inflation target of 2.5% in terms of RPIX, and later uh, changed to 2% in terms of the CPI inflation target. And the forecasts for inflation and policy response is one for the bank to determine. And some of you present here today uh, were in the room uh, as the bank decided how that process should work of setting interest rates in this new way. Rate setting was now a technical matter, not a political one. And the decision was for nine independent experts and not one individual. Decision making by committee had a new dynamic as data and forecasts needed to be absorbed and decisions produced by voting. The communication of policy decisions also took on a new guise with a press conference, market briefings and minutes released within short order. And this raised many questions of how the MPC should form decisions and how best to communicate them. And these three issues, the remit, uh, the decision-making process and the communication are three of our themes that we'll discuss today. But there's also a fourth issue, which relates to the instruments of monetary policy. From 1992 to 2008, the control of the official interest rate, bank rate, was uniformly acknowledged to be the main instrument of policy, supplemented by communication, which also played an important role in managing expectations. Throughout the nice decade, there was very little indication of the seismic change that would be required, uh, that would require new monetary instruments after the global financial crisis. But after 2008, short-term interest rates in the major economies were cut decisively and quickly reached their zero lower bound, as it was then called. The only country that had any previous experience of rates that low was Japan, and uh, all the central banks, major central banks, viewed it as practically impossible to lower them any further. So the subsequent years would see the emergence of unconventional policy tools in the UK, the asset purchase facility, the term lending, and forward guidance, to name just a few. And this too marked a big departure from 
the situation 25 years earlier. And so this will be our, th our fourth theme for discussion uh, later. So the establishment of the MPC was a really significant moment in UK monetary history. And it served the UK well with inflation averaging exactly 2% over those 25 years, but much less volatile. The purpose of this meeting is really to learn lessons from the experience of the MPC, and we couldn't have picked a better team of people to uh, discuss it. So we're really looking forward to the discussion later. But before I, we reach those discussions, it's my pleasure to be able to introduce Ben Broadbent, Deputy Governor for Monetary Policy, um, to open up with a keynote speech. So Ben has a background in, in government, academia, investment banking. I don't really need to introduce him to, to you. You all know him very well. Uh, he began his service in the MPC in June of 20, 2011, first as an external MPC member and subsequently as deputy governor from 2014. And he's going to speak today on the subject of forward guidance under the title Reliable Partners. Um, and after the speech, there'll be an opportunity for us to ask questions, so please do ask questions in the room. Um, please keep them short. We're, there are an awful, awful lot of people that want to ask questions, and we won't be able to ask me, uh, answer many. So uh, keep the questions as short as you can. And if you're watching online, if you're on Zoom, please put the questions into the chat. Um, there won't be an opportunity for you to ask questions yourself. Um, so... Um, uh, let me just say one last thing that we will be taking notes during the course of this, uh, this meeting uh, to write up uh, the proceedings in some way. Um, so just be aware that we're doing that, but we don't want that at all to influence what you say. We won't be using uh, the notes to attribute to people uh, in a way that will, uh, without asking them afterwards, whether they're happy with what we have uh, attributed to them, if we do attribute them. So anyway, thank you very much. Uh, and let me introduce now uh, over to Beth. very much, uh, Paul. Hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure uh, to see so many familiar faces and a great pleasure to be here at Gresham College, which is one of the few institutions in the city that's older than the bank, a um, hundred years older, in fact. I'd also like to thank both NISA and the, the MMF for organizing the event. Uh, so as you know, we are living through the most extraordinary and in many ways extraordinarily unwelcome time, Russia's unprovoked attack on Ukraine has brought war to Europe for the first time in decades with all its terrible humanitarian consequences. And from an economic perspective, coming on top of what was already a very steep rise in the cost of globally traded goods in the wake of the pandemic, the invasion has led to substantial rises in the cost of energy and other commodities. I think it's doubtful that the UK has ever experienced an external hit uh, to its real national income on this scale. From the narrow perspective of monetary policy, of course, it will result in the near term, at least, in the very difficult combination of even higher inflation, but weaker growth of domestic demand and output. However, the MPC has already said uh, quite a bit about these things, both individually and collectively, and dramatic uh, its economics effects have been. My topic today is not uh, this awful conflict or the immediate questions it poses monetary policy. I've no doubt we'll have an opportunity to talk about those things in the Q&A, but I'm going to talk instead about something more general, uh, namely communication and specifically this term forward guidance. And I will take that to mean in this general form statements by monetary authorities about future policy. And I want to talk a bit about the theory, a bit about the actual experience of it and uh, some of the pitfalls. And in one form or another, we're always being pressed uh, for this information. I think the question, what is going to happen to interest rates is asked of us pretty much routinely in one form or another. And perhaps it's understandable that people should want to know uh, particularly in an environment as uncertain as this. Surely, if it were possible to eliminate or reduce at least one source of unpredictability, wouldn't that be a good thing? And since the MPC is in control of interest rates, why can't it just tell us what it's going to do? And the problem, of course, is that we, we can't be sure, and interest rates are not an end uh, in themselves. They're a means of meeting our objectives, which is the stabilization of inflation over the medium term, and subject to that, 
uh, of economic activity. And because there are lots of unpredictable shocks hitting the economy, uh, things that would otherwise and often do move output and inflation around, the appropriate path of interest rates is itself necessarily unpredictable. And the skipper of a boat adapting to a skittish wind and interested in making the journey as smooth as possible may have perfect control of the tiller, but that doesn't mean she can tell you exactly which position it will be in at every point in the future. Now, it's not that monetary authorities are unconcerned about expectations of future interest rates, quite the opposite, and they matter a lot. So, as you know, we directly determine only one very particular interest rate in the economy, which is the overnight rate that banks get on their deposits at the central bank. But demand and spending in the economy depend much more on longer term interest rates. So in this country, um, around half of, just over half, I think, of UK corporate borrowing is done at maturity of three years or more. And uh, actually quite a lot of mortgage debt is now at least no longer very short term. Again, more than half of it has tied to interest rates of uh, at least two years. So those longer term rates and therefore the expectations of the future short rate on which they're based clearly matter. Equally, however, those expectations should and generally do respond to the news about the economy of their own accord without the need for any explicit prompting by the central bank. The private sector is continually updating its own views of the future. And as long as people also understand the objectives of the central bank and therefore the appropriate response of policy to possible future outcomes, they should then be able to work out for themselves what that news means uh, for the likely path of interest rates. And indeed, when economic conditions are relatively stable, there isn't that much to work out as one can observe the central bank's reaction function, so-called, uh, pretty much directly. Uh, this is a graph of not quite uh, policy in orange, but it's a smooth version of changes in interest rates, if you like. It's the average vote on the MPC uh, in basis points. And it's plotted against a survey-based measure of economic growth. And you can see, at least until the crisis, uh, it was a pretty tight correlation. Indeed, you didn't really need anything else empirically to explain interest rates. Now, Mervyn, I know, used to object to this graph, didn't like it at all. And he said in a speech, I think for the 10th anniversary of the MPC, we have no reaction function and the world is sort of chaotic and so unpredictable. And indeed, some of the things he talked about then I will touch on here, you may have some sympathy for these views, but in my view, they're more justification now than they did in the 10 years until 2007. I think there was such a thing as a stable reaction function, as this makes clear, and indeed it makes economic sense. If you live in a world where you think trend growth is very stable, and there are no real enduring effects on inflation other than pressure on domestic resources, the exchange rate moves around a bit, but the offense don't last that long. Commodity price effects are gone within a year or so. Then this is the right way to behave. Um, best way to, you know, if every increase in growth necessarily increases the pressure on resources, then you want to lean against it and uh, equally ease policy when growth is weak. And that's all you need to know. And indeed, when there was, and by the way, just here, you can see that in an environment in which there is a stable reaction function, forward market interest rates similarly are pretty well correlated or were pretty well correlated with this. People observed directly a sort of reduced form of how the MPC behaved and reacted similarly in, in response to, to news about economic activity. You may remember that uh, Mervyn hailed this cyclicality of forward interest rates saying it helped to stabilize the economy, which it did, um, without putting too much burden on the policy rate itself. And in a very unlikely comparison, he suggested that this was similar to the behavior of the hapless England defenders against the great Diego Maradona in the 1986 World Cup, which was the first and I've written here the day say the last time that MPC members were likened to an elite sportsman. Um, although Michael Saunders pointed out to me yesterday that Andy once 
wrote something, I don't remember it, where we were likened to Ian Bell and Joe Root. I won't comment on the elitism of the um, England cricket team. So given this kind of behavior, why would you do forward guidance if, if in principle, at least financial markets and others, the whole private sector as a whole can work out what you wanna do anyway? And I think in theory, there are two distinct types. I think the reasons for both have been connected with changes in the economy, but they are quite distinct. And it's pretty important to understand how they're distinct. And the first, which is sometimes described in the economics literature, slightly grandiosely, I think, as quotes, Delphic guidance, seeks in general to convey what is sometimes referred to as private information held by the central bank. That makes it sound a lot more exciting uh, than it really is. More often than not, it simply means you make clear to the outside world the policymakers' view of how the economy might evolve over the future. In other words, you publish a forecast and also you clarify the reaction function, how policy might respond to possible future events. Now, I said that this pre-crisis pattern, especially the one you can see here, was the appropriate response given the stability of the economy at the time. But if that was a reasonable view of the world, then uh, it's clearly been much less of one since productivity growth uh, is much less predictable. And there have been plenty, and no one here needs reminding of this, plenty of uh, global shocks with enduring effects on inflation. We're living through one right now. Uh, so sim simple rules of thumb like this are, are therefore less reliable. And you can see here, by the way, it's pretty clear that after the crisis, this correlation deteriorates. And therefore, it might be an advantage for the central bank to communicate more about how policy is being set, more about the, uh, the reaction function. And this can come in various forms. Um, regular forecasts can't, I think. You can speak directly about the changing environment and the implications for the reaction function. So I gave a talk in 2013 explaining how when you're less sure about productivity growth and you're no longer confident of some fixed rate of trend growth, that you should pay more attention to the labor market and less to output data. And monetary authorities have made often more specific remarks about the near-term path of interest rates, depending on how things turn out. So you might hear things like, if the economy develops in line with our forecast, then policy might be expected to do such and such a thing. And a handful of central banks also publish forecasts of the policy rate itself alongside those for GDP and inflation. And their joint behavior can help people understand how these things interact. So not all Delphic guidance involves statements about directly about policy, about the path of interest rates. It comes in these various forms. And whichever form it does come in, I think the important point to understand is that it's always conditional. These are and should always be seen as if then statements. And their purpose is not to pledge some particular path of policy independently of what happens in the economy. It's to help people understand the dependence of policy on the economic outlook. Now, the other form uh, with the, uh, another classical, slightly grandiose name, addition, uh, the other form of guidance is very different in this respect. It actively promises a certain path pretty much, in, order, in particular, generally to keep interest rates very low, almost regardless uh, of how things turn out. And it is a means of easing monetary conditions and specifically of lowering longer term real interest rates when the outlook for inflation is weak, but the immediate policy rate is constrained by the lower bound. And if you believe other alternatives like QE are for some reason unavailable or ineffective, and if you're able to convince people that even in the event of a positive shock to inflation in the future, you won't raise interest rates, this can push up inflation expectations, reduce the real forward rate of interest and encourage more demand today. Now, as we'll see, and I'll go through some slides with some simple simulations about this shortly, uh, this promise uh, to be irresponsible, as Krugman call it, won't necessarily be believed because when the time comes, and if there were some subsequently some rise in inflationary pressure, 
the policymaker will be tempted to go back on the earlier promise and respond by raising interest rates. So the policy is intrinsically time inconsistent. But if you can find a way of tying yourself to the policy in advance, like Odysseus lashing himself to the mast of his ship, hence the name, then in principle, this is an effective way of easing monetary conditions, even when the policy rate itself can't be lowered any further. Now, it's very striking that in the academic literature, this is the thing, this committed form of guidance that has received much more attention. But in the real world, and despite spending much of the last decade or so right up against the lower bound, central banks have used it only very rarely. And I will pick up one, essentially one period of time where the Fed did it. Otherwise, I think it's hard to argue that any other central bank has. And one reason for that, I think, is that QE has actually been effective, certainly at times of great liquidity strains in markets. I think there are other reasons too, and as I'll bear out, I, I think this intrinsic problem of time and consistency makes it very difficult, particularly in this country, for reasons I'll explain. So for whatever the reason, just about all guidance have been as this Delphic, much more conditional form. And yet my impression is that the outside world can and often does mistake one for the other, that the if clause is somehow forgotten or downplayed and purely conditional statements somehow get interpreted or rather misinterpreted as hard commitments. I'll offer some reasons why, um, but my concern about this, I think, is that if you do this, if people come to rely on these statements and view them as hard commitments, rather than thinking about the economy and its implications for interest rates for themselves, that that detracts from uh, the stabilization property of monetary policy. And I'm not saying that this is definitely the reason for that. There are plenty of explanations for this. This demonstrates a sort of rolling regression of the sensitivity of forward interest rates to news and economic data, Great moderation is over, things are much less predictable. So it's understandable if markets can infer or feel less confident about inferring things about the medium term from short term data. That's undoubtedly got to be one reason for this. The world is just no longer evidently stationary. Um, the fact that central banks have been at the lower bound is surely another, because that necessarily attenuates the response of forward interest rates. But I think it's possible as well. Uh, that an over-reliance on central bank communication and a misinterpretation of it as a fixed plan for interest rates might have contributed to this trend. If you believe that the monetary authority will always tell you in advance what it's going to do, maybe you feel less inclined to anticipate and price such a response yourself. I don't know if this is true. This is hardly any sort of formal test. It's really no more than a conjecture, but clearly it would be an irony if an effort to get people to think more about how monetary, monetary policy might respond to events by communicating more about this reaction function had actually had the opposite effect. So let me just go through, I'm gonna fill in some of the gaps now, that's pretty much all I want to say, but I'm gonna go through some of the gaps with the help of some simulations. And um, I thank him in the speech, but I should thank him now that he's here because Rich Harrison has given me a lot of help with these. And I'm very grateful. So these simulations are with a very simple standard, simplified macro model, just an IS curve and a, and a Phillips curve. Um, and I want to represent graphically some of the things I've, I've just said. And starting with this, this point about Odyssean guidance, as you know, the last 20, probably 30 years in this country, that the underlying real equilibrium rate of interest has declined. That's been a global phenomenon, actually, and it's pushed the equivalent neutral nominal rate close to the lower bound. There's much more limited room, at least until recently, to uh, respond um, to disinflationary shocks when they come in. And this in turn creates the room for sort of traps uh, where a decline in expectations would push up real rates, depress demand and inflation, and therefore justify the original and ultimately self-perpetuating weakness of expectations. And the response to that 
has mostly been QE, but as I say, many academics pushed for something else, much more committed form of forward guidance. And we've hit this economy with lots and lots of shocks, um, varied two things. One, the distance from the lower bound, which is along the x-axis. And the other is the nature of uh, the regime you're in. Here, the red policymaker cannot make uh, credible commitments about future policy and sort of unfettered by anything else, resets and re-optimizes every period. And obviously in principle, we all know more discretion sounds like a good thing. The better way to think about it, I think, is that the blue person who can essentially gets to set forward as well as spot interest rates. If he can make credible statements about the future, and when you can't do anything, at least you can't cut the spot rate, being able to use this other tool credibly is pretty powerful. On the y-axis is uh, the central bank's objective function. Um, and you can see that when you have commitment in principle, uh, you can improve outcomes a lot uh, close to the lower bound. Uh, you're able to commit to weak future policy and loose future policy, even in the event of higher inflation. And this model, at least, where forward real rates have a powerful effect on spending, you bring those forward rates down because inflation expectations go up and voila, with one bound, you are free of the lower bound. Not quite, still might be expected to be caught in this trap now and then, but certainly less often uh, than the um, person who doesn't have this ability to, uh, to commit credibly. Now, as I said, I, in my view in practice, this has very, very rarely been used. Uh, much more often it's been statements of forward guidance have been hedged very clearly conditional. Even the example I'm gonna show you, you could argue that's still conditional, but I think the Fed's journey in the years after the crisis gets to a place in 2012, which is, as close as you can to this kind of Odyssean guidance. Uh, so they began with more of a sort of conditional forecast of interest rates. Post Lehman, weak economic conditions are likely to warrant exceptionally low levels of the federal fund rate. So that's not saying we will, it's just saying we expect because we expect the economy to be weak. Uh, then they put a timeline on it in 2011. And then they added two quite important things, I think, a year later, um, at what turned out to be the sort of zenith of the Eurozone crisis. Uh, not only a timeline, but they said very clearly, A, that policy is accommodative. So we think that R is below R star, if you like, and that they're gonna keep it accommodative uh, even after the economy strengthens. So that was as close as you can get to saying, we're gonna be deliberately dovish even when the economy covers and we're gonna put the timeline on it. And I think that was pretty quote addition, pretty committed guidance. Otherwise, I think these are hard to find. Some people have said the ECB's recent uh, statements uh, about its strategy are similar. I'm not so sure. This is more about general strategy, right? And even the red person will want to change behavior around the zero bound for risk management reasons. I think that's what this is mainly about, the ECB statement. And incidentally, those central banks that publish forecasts of interest rates argue that those two are sort of Delphic guidance. They're there to teach people about the reaction function. They're not meant as commitments to a future, particular future path of interest rates. As for the UK, we've always been at pains uh, to point out uh, that when we ever we say something about future policy, it's contingent on how the outlook for the economy itself evolves over time. So in August 2013, when Mark Carney arrived, we had this threshold-based stuff. Uh, we set out a necessary condition, not a sufficient one, in terms of the unemployment rate for a rise in bank rate. So it's a reasonably weak condition, as I say, it's not sufficient. Um, and we had this proviso at the end about price and financial stability. February 2014, this was really a 
statement about the low level of R star. It certainly wasn't any sort of commitment to future policy. It was more a very, very general forecast of where you might reasonably expect the appropriate policy rate to go within a very broad range. And we took pains to say precisely because we were worried that people might interpret this as some sort of committed path, the actual path of bank rate will depend on economic developments, blah, 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 blah. And then we reduced that more succinctly a year or so later uh, to the phrase, this guidance is an expectation, not a promise. So, and by the way, this was one last one of Marx. I'll come back to this later, just because it got a lot of criticism. Uh, at the time, he gave a speech around that time, July 2015, the decision as to when to start raising interest rates will likely come. I tried to get rid of likely as an adverb because we all know it's an adjective, but Mark insisted on it. Um, into sharper relief around the turn of the year. But I am conscious of several important considerations. I mean, the actual path will certainly not be mechanical, linear, or predetermined. On and on and on. You know, what happens in the meantime will be the ultimate determinant of interest rates. So very, very clearly conditional. So why, why, given the advantages, the potential advantages I showed you, that gap between the solid blue and red lines, uh, hasn't it been used more often? Has it been used so rarely? Well, one reason is these models, as they are acutely sensitive to forward real interest rates. So in the simplest of these, which are just the extension of some Euler equation, I can cut the forward one year rate in 10 years time and have almost as much impact on current demand as if I cut the spot rate. And that can't be right, really. That must be an exaggeration. Um, one can think of all sorts of reasons in theory why, but clearly I think it is. So that gap will be smaller if, if you reduce the, the, the power of that effect of forward real rates. But another reason is, as I say, I think, the, the fact that the policy is in intrinsically time inconsistent. Yes, if you can promise to be irresponsible and if people believe you, it can have powerful effects, but there is a big difference, I think, between a promise in abstract to be irresponsible in advance of some hypothetical uh, inflationary shock. It's quite another, uh, I can tell you, in the teeth of a real one, actually to be irresponsible. By that time, the promise is in the past, the inflation is happening now, and it obviously feels much more important to deal with what's in front of you than to abide by a pledge you might have given some time, even some years earlier. Uh, this is the result of a simulation done by Rich and a couple of others to get that point across really and it says well suppose there's a probability only that you will abide by the uh, the past promise and as the temptation to break the promise goes up in other words as the scale of the inflationary shock afterwards were it to come gets bigger that probability of being able to keep your promise falls and you're more likely to start reneging on it and when you do that obviously you undo the power of the policy. This is the catch 22 of, of time and consistent policies. There's no point in making a promise unless you're subsequently tempted to break it. And once you start introducing this effect, then the blue line starts drifting up to the red line and you get much less benefit. And I think that really matters. I mean, you can only get down to that blue line if there's some mechanism, some addition mast that's so powerful that no matter the scale of the subsequent temptation, the cost of breaking a promise is always bigger. And I just, in practice, find it hard to see that there is one. I mean, reputation might help, uh, but you've got to realize you're committing not just your future self in, in the UK system, uh, but you're trying to commit the votes of other people, some of whom you probably have never even met. And I think this is a point, I mean, I'm sure other people have been on the NPC will back me up, that's generally underappreciated in the outside world. The NPC is a democracy, right? My vote is no more important than anybody else's. And uh, as you know, it's part of the UK's constitution that no parliament can bind its successor. And I'm not sure, frankly, it would cut much, cut much ice with parliament's treasury committee if I said I was voting not on the basis of going on what was going on right now in the economy, 
but instead because of some guidance a few years ago by an earlier MPC, half of which, half of whose personnel have since changed. So I think it's very difficult to think of mechanisms that would bring you all the way down to the blue line. I think that's one of the reasons it hasn't been done. I picked out some, some of the highlights, if you want to call them that, of the MPC's guidance. As I say, they were all heavily conditional, but I think it's clear from the reaction we had to them that this critical point about conditionality was not universally understood, uh, nor were other bits of it. In the summer of 2013, we offered this necessary condition, but it seemed widely to be interpreted as a sufficient one. So we would apparently be forced to raise interest rates, people said, if unemployment fell below 7%, no matter what the outlook for inflation was at the time. And as for the important point about conditionality, it was two days after this February report with all its, you know, several words emphasizing that what actually happened would depend on the future economy. The BBC said, what is forward guidance? It is making a promise about the future, particularly about future interest rates. And despite the intervening and frequently reiterated points that these were an expectation quotes, not a promise, there was a newspaper comment only a couple of months ago that referred to quotes, the many promises made by the MPC to raise interest rates. Now there may be plenty of reasons for this misunderstanding. Uh, you know, this fairly convoluted language we use. We're never gonna come up with something as punchy as un unreliable boyfriend. Uh, which is what M one MP called the MPC, I think, back in 2014. Um, and frankly, nor does using things like Delphic and Odyssean guidance help. Uh, they're not the things that will, you know, grab the public straight away. The very fact we use the same word guidance for the things which, in my view, are very different, doesn't itself help. I think part of it may also be wishful. We know people don't like uncertainty. Uh, they want to know about the future and they think, well, why can't you just tell us what you're going to do? Uh, so I, I, I do have some sympathy for a point that Martin Wheel made in a letter to the FT in 2018. The letter was titled, the MPC can't make promises about future interest rates. And he said this, the pressure on the bank for clearer communication is a consequence of people wanting the future to be less uncertain than it is. Anyway, my worry about this, as I say, is that there is a potential cost, uh, one that's more important than the odd unreliable boyfriend tag, that if people come to rely too much on explicit steers from the bank, forward interest rate and our other asset prices may become insufficiently sensitive to economic news. And if in turn the central bank acquiesces uh, to the desire for more definitive statements about the future path of interest rates, and feels the need to signal policy changes well in advance, this could compromise its own ability uh, to, to stabilize and to offset shocks that come along in the meantime. So I've tried to get this across with a, and by the way, just that particular example here, you know that Mark came in for a lot of criticism when interest rates did not six months later go up, but it's really hard to see how you could have hedged this any more than he did. So try to simulate that here. And I said, well, let's suppose the central bank declares the next few periods of interest rates and says, this is what we're gonna do. And people believe the bank, it's entirely credible. So in giving it that, that big advantage, but it can only update this periodically, this plan. Uh, I mean, in reality, the solid blue line you update the appropriate path all the time, continually as new comes in, but we've supposed in the dotted blue line, it can only do it occasionally. And you get a bit of an advantage relative to red near the lower bound, but you're everywhere worse than the blue and quite soon worse than the red because you're unable to respond to shocks. Now remember that this is a model where the forward real rates really matter. So having the wrong forward real rate, which is what this dotted blue line matters a lot as well, maybe too much in this simulation, but clearly you lose a lot in stabilization property if you feel you have to commit to a path just because that's what people want you to do. So let me sum up. It would be nice, obviously, if interest rates were more predictable. It would be nice if a lot of things were more predictable. But of course, lots of things are not, including lots of things that 
might otherwise disturb inflation over the medium term. And because it's the job of monetary policy to respond to these, uh, then interest rates themselves are necessarily unpredictable. Now, there are particular circumstances in which committing more unambiguously to a path can be an advantage, as, as we've seen. Uh, but even when such commitment is believed, I think the effects are probably smaller than the ones here in simple economic models where forward rates are pretty powerful. Such a promise is by its nature non-credible. You know you're going to be tempted to break it and is therefore unlikely to be effective unless there's some mechanism for keeping you to it. And I think the hurdle to that, by the way, is higher in the UK than elsewhere. And I think this helps to explain why, in practice, central banks have made such commitments only very rarely, even uh, when the most pressing problem was the threat of low inflation. Uh, there is quite obviously even less of a case for it today. And yet, as I say, my impression has been that even when central banks attempt to engage in more standard conditional statements, they can sometimes be mistaken for firmer commitments than they really are. And the potential cost is that forward interest rates and monetary conditions, perhaps even the spot rate itself, um, but certainly the forward conditions become over dependent on these communications and insufficiently sensitive to economic news. So clearly, central bank has an obligation to set out its view of the outlook, not least to explain the stance of policy today. And my understanding of it, that was one of the main reasons for the inflation report. It was not to give an in indication of interest rates over the future. Recognizing there are lags in policy, uh, it was really to explain today's policy decision. In a very changeable economic environment in particular, may want to say more about its potential reaction function uh, to possible outcomes. And clearly, we have an interest in how forward expectations behave because they really determine the interest rates that the private sector faces. But I do think that whatever the medium, monetary authorities always need to think about the message, uh, not least the point that future policy will depend on how the outlook for inflation evolves, and that is well understood. Um, as I say, that the names Delphic and Edition really don't help, particularly since it turns out that the Oracle at Delphi often spoke in riddles. So maybe we shouldn't say central banks are Delphic. Uh, riddles that were encouraged apparently by the hallucinogenic gases that were released from rocks uh, surrounding the temple. Now, the more appropriate bit of that comparison, I think, is one of the many things that uh, people have said that get across the point, the slightly fatalistic point that the world is uncertain, just put up with it. Um, I heard one the other day from John, how do you make God laugh? Tell him your plans. Uh, this was written on, on, on the temple at Delphi, often translated as surety brings ruin. Actually, the direct translations apparently make a pledge and mischief is nigh. I quite like the Mike Tyson version that you can see here. So you know, that's really the message. We, we care about future expectations, uh, but I think we have to be wary given this potential misinterpretation to which we have contributed clearly with language, which is not clear enough or direct enough. Uh, that people misinterpret what are conditional statements as overly unconditional. And I think there may be a potential cost to that. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions now. How do you think of the Fed's AIT? as fitting in this framework. It looks like they're refused to hike the interest rate in the face of a very strong economy and now are gonna to have to go very quickly delivering a path that looks a bit like a Rich Harrison optimal commitment path where you go very steep and possibly overshoot. I wonder how that fits within this discretion and commitment framework you've outlined here. Yeah, I mean, I don't know whether the outcomes of those policies are themselves whether the objectives are sort of time consistent, if you see what I mean. Um, 
I mean, given the, 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 the risk they were facing at the time, they remember that unlike in the UK, that had a long period where inflation expectations and core inflation itself were lower than they wanted. Uh, the ECB faced an even more severe difficulty, albeit neither being like the Japanese, but there was an answer to that question. Uh, I think the bit that was I wanted to know was, at least I would have done as an outside observer, is you know, what, how much is enough? Um, when have you made up for this stuff? Over what period do you measure it? Um, you may remember that in the old fiscal rules, we used to have back during the great moderation with some notion of, you know, I just sort of have some window over which, but the length of the window and the, was never quite clear. It seemed to be at the discretion of the chancellor. And similarly, I'm not exactly sure uh, how much is enough, but it's clearly in that direction. It's, it's ad addressing, I think, designed to address this particular risk. No, look, the, the, the blue person can always do exactly what the red person does. The way to think about this is it just has a bigger choice set. And so, you know, most, I mean, we learned after Kidlam and Pres Prescott, most optimal policy is time inconsistent. It's pretty rare, frankly, you have a setting where that's not the case. And so I think, as I say, the best way to think about it is you've given this person the ability to control forward as well as spot interest rates. Which is, which is quite a powerful thing, especially in these models where they, they really matter for current demand. Tony. Yeah. But there's nothing to conceal, Tony. I'm not concealing anything. What, why? I vote on today's interest rate. I don't vote on tomorrow's interest rate. Why? I don't have anything in mind. What do I have in mind? And the lags do not mean that I have to set forward interest rates. They simply mean that I have to publish a forecast of the economy in order to explain the context for today's decision. And this is exactly my problem with the thing, that people say, you have some plan. And I think, well, why do people want that information? Because they think I'm committed to some plan. Well, then there's nothing in the economy. The best thing you can have is our view of the future and our view of the reaction function. That's entirely sufficient. Unless you think there's commitment involved, that is sufficient. There is nothing else I can give you that doesn't involve commitment that can be remotely useful. Everything is in there. Yeah, I don't think that adds anything. I really think, as I say, unless you think there's a degree of commitment, it doesn't add anything, technically. Well, I, I think that's true. Um, I, I very much uh, agree with your take on um, the, the limits to uh, Odyssean guidance is one of the oddities of the academic literature that there's lots of analysis of mm. uh, optimal paths on the commitment and so forth and zero discussion of what commitment mechanisms uh, make them uh, viable uh, and just going back to the earlier comment average inflation targeting doesn't help because uh, future uh, policy committees yeah. can change the uh, the description of the objective that they're going for. So I've always thought that forward guide, a Dissian forward guidance uh, could only work over very short 
time horizons. Now, I think the August 2011 Fed yeah. case is the one example, because if you actually look at what happened to the term structure, uh, when they made their announcement about keeping rates low for the next two years, you do get a, a noticeable uh, movement, not only just in the front end, but actually a long two years out. But, you know, beyond that, it's very difficult to see how you can get much traction simply because of this lack of a, uh, a credible uh, commitment mechanism. Um, but switching to the, what I wanted to ask you, I mean, I, I think our experience of the, um, uh, the 2013 forward guidance when Mark Carney mm. came in wasn't a particularly happy one. Um, now, I think you're absolutely right to suggest that, you know, we stress that it was necessary, not sufficient, that it was all conditional, all that sort of stuff. Uh, but um, uh, observers, uh, the press, uh, some market participants and so forth, uh, translated conditional to unconditional, translated as you observe, uh, necessary into sufficient uh, and stuff like that. Um, and the lesson that I took from that is if you are going to give guidance uh, of any sort, it has to be really pretty simple and mm -hmm. broad brush, which no, the not. second form uh, that we gave the following year about, which was really about the awesome. underlying natural yeah. rate fitted into that. Uh, and I wonder whether uh, this sort of importance of simplicity is something that oh, you absolutely. would agree I, Definitely. With. I mean, I, you know, I think, I, if you think of the log logical structure of that 2013, if not P, then not Q. I mean, there's not something that there is actually a cognitive research in the area of cognition showing that, you know, people can understand conditionals quite well if you make them rooted in the real world and quite simple, but the more abstract they are, the more they fail to come across. And I think that was one which was, I don't know, didn't pass muster, obviously. I mean, as we've discovered, um, I mean, it survived only a short time, as we know. So maybe it didn't matter that much, but um, well, indeed, <laughs> indeed. Um, so I think that it, that is a lesson uh, that they really have to be clear. And I think that you know when we say, for example, our expectations of interest rates, we may as economists think, well, that's you know the arithmetic mean of a conditional distribution, and people on the outside here, well, this is what will happen to interest rates. Apparently. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, one takeaway for me was that people might be listening too much to central bankers and especially the uh, misunderstanding the, the conditionality and the guidance. I was wondering, is there is a risk of the opposite as well? Over time, as central banks make conditional statements and people simply stop listening to central banks mm. and central banks lose that ability to influence inflation expectations. Mm. Should we be concerned around that? No, I think that's, I think that's right. And I think uh, you know, if people think you've made one thing and then it doesn't happen, you're the unreliable boyfriend, uh, then it can have a cumulative cost, I agree. And uh, one has to be sparing. I remember when I was still, when I hadn't a bank, I was still in my previous job and I did a survey of, I mean, for, relatively informed of clients, internal and external, because there'd been some controversy over the MPC's decision to raise interest rates in August, 2006. Uh, and the, the apparently, I mean, this criticism, I have to say, came almost exclusively from people who failed to predict it. And they said, well, why didn't they pre-announce the hike? And I did this survey because I thought that, no, I, can't, you know, I just don't agree um, that they should have done. And because that just loses you time. Uh, unless you believe or in this committed world where you want to 
then why give up a month, a quarter of discretion for the, just for the sake of, you know, appeasing a few people in financial markets? Doesn't make sense. And so I did this survey and I asked lots of questions and the answers are all of them were unsurprising. The answers, the only one where the answers really surprised me was one where I said, do you think central banks communicate too little about right, too much? And I was convinced that everyone would say too little, you know, and this is everything has to mean want more and more and more. And actually 90% of people said too much. And we've only done more since. And someone wrote the comment, and there's a little comment somewhere, and I said, sometimes these people should just shut up. <laughs> so I, you know, I have some sympathy for that because if you have this risk of misinterpretation, it's all really, really clear. A, people misunderstand, and then you're right, they hold you to account for the wrong thing. Second question from the Zoom chat. Um, so somebody here has asked, uh, can the bank make use of medium term forecasts as a medium uh, to comment on market expectations and use that as a signaling tool in its own right? Um, so how, how could the bank make use of its medium term I'm, forecasts? Well, as I say, I mean, I, you know, the central banks that do this, that publish interest rate forecasts, present them very much as, quote, Delphic. We want to get across the reaction function. And I think there are lots of ways of doing that. And my, my and, you know, and it may be that future embassies decide to do that. But my concern about it is, as it is with all these things, is are you getting across the point about conditionality? So years ago, a few years ago, around the time of that box, it would have been 2013 or something, I gave a talk about R star and why, you know, all the various reasons it might be very low. And, and there was a journalist in the room who said, we should publish our forecast of R star or I should resign, uh, which was a bit dramatic. And I said, well, actually, I'm going to do neither. And I remember um, talking then about a quote in a paper by John Williams, current New York Fed, where he quoted a namesake of his many years ago, uh, who was a Welshman called John Williams at Harvard, who said, look, this, this Wixelli and R-Star thing is very useful uh, in principle to understand what's gone on in the world. And it's useful for us now to think, you know, why is it that the, the, the rate that stabilizes the economy has come down? Um, but he said in, in real time, it's not useful. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty about it. It's something he said that's revealed after the event. To be precise, he said, like faith, it is seen by works. And that's what's happened to us. We've looked and we said, oh, look, you know, the interest rate that has kept inflation stable has come down. But it is not an independent guide to how we set policy now. I don't have to forecast its future. I don't set future interest rates. And I think the dangers of this sort of thing are precisely what happened, say, with Jay Powell early on in his tenure when he said, oh, we're still a long way from our star. And that had a pretty violent reaction in financial markets for two reasons, I think. One, because, well, both the particular fact and the general fact that he was saying, oh, well, there's something guiding policy that's not the current economy. And he divorced and he's thinking, oh my God, they've just got a lot more hawkish, independently of anything else. So as you go further and further out in the horizon, your forecast for interest rates will necessarily just become R star plus inflation. And why on earth should I know any better what that's gonna be than anybody else? Why is that of any help to anybody unless they think somehow, ooh, there's, there's some sort of commitment there in some form. Otherwise, I just, I don't see the point. And I think it carries a lot of risk with it, as I say. Uh, if you're worried about uh, people over obsessing about the particular rate path and mm. uh, misunderstanding or not understanding at all the conditionality, it's not one way to get around that problem. Publish a rate path, put it inside a fan chart and spend a chapter of the monetary policy report explaining the reasons why you would deviate off that rate path. Could that well, not solve a lot of the problems? Yeah, but then not publishing, it would also be. A, I mean, my point is that it comes with risks. To me, a more direct way of doing it, and it's just my opinion, so future NPCs may, may well do that, I don't know. But I see at least as much risk as benefit in doing that. I think a much more direct way to do it is say, here's a simulation. And I think we could, could do that. 
But even then, and this comes back to the point about you know, whether you can commit, we were in a committee of nine people. I am not going to try and pin down or even suggest I'm not just my future vote, but eight other people. The only way you could ever do it, have any sort of even a simulated path of interest rates was to make clear this is completely automatic. It's some feedback rule. It's no more than an expression of the forecast. It's nothing else, nothing else at all. There is no information value other than the forecast on which it's based. That's all you could ever do because I am not going, there is no single policymaker in this setup. There are lots. And you know, I have found that even making the, the few statements we do about future policy, that you need something akin to a supermajority on the committee. It's not enough to have five people bullying the other four into saying something, it's not enough. So they're very difficult to make. And I can, I, my prediction would be that we tried to do this on the MPC. We could spend a week discussing it and still not, and, and it could only be completely automatic with a whole disclaimer saying that's what it is. And therefore have zero information content other than the forecast on which it's based. I mean, that, that is the reality of it. So would that be helpful? Yes. Would it carry risks? Yes. And, and, you know, as I say, even a simulation, uh, and, you know, that, that's, that's the issue. I certainly don't see it as some sort of salvation that would make everything clear or give private information that we have, because we just don't have it. And the private information we have, we publish in the forecast, the economic forecast. I realise there are lots of other people who might ask questions. Uh, Really run over time. There will be an opportunity in the fourth session on communication to talk again about forward guidance and some of these issues. But let me thank you, thank Ben very much for an excellent speech, and we'll thank him in the usual way. Thank you.